Welcome to The Broker Experience. We are your hosts. My name is Rick Dulai, and I'm joined by Rob Scalisi and Chuck Cascione. Hello. Good morning. All right. Today's topic, we're going to talk about EMDs, otherwise known as earnest money deposits. Um, and as simple as it sounds, this can actually become a pretty complicated topic. And I think even a lot of agents aren't aware of all the different... Neither are the buyers and sellers. Right, <laughs> right. Know? So, so I think we can talk about it from both perspectives. We can talk about it from what sell... Or there's three perspectives. What agents can expect and what situations may come up that they have to deal with. Um, what a seller could anticipate and expect and what a buyer should anticipate when it comes to their earnest money deposits. So why don't we start off with this, Chuck? Why don't you define what an earnest money deposit is? It's a... It's a, an amount, it's a, a consideration that accompanies the offer. It's like, call it a good faith deposit. Right. You know, um, it's- You're being earnest. Yeah, you're being <laughs> earnest. You're saying, here's my offer. Now, it's not required. It's not really right. required for, to you know, it, it, contract law tells us that we need offer acceptance and consideration. The offer is the writing, the acceptance is the signature, the consideration is the money that we're paying for the property. Right. So it's really not required. It's kind of more common practice. Um, and it does happen sometimes that people offer a zero EMD. True, true. It is absolutely not even not really required. It's not required. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not required at all. Right. So it's what it does is it shows the seller and everybody involved in the transaction that the buyer's serious. They wrote an offer and they gave me a thousand dollar check to accompany the offer. It's an earnest money deposit shows that I'm that the buyer is bargaining in good faith and that they've put their money where their mouth is and they've they've accompanied this. But you know? we all also value it in the sense that if I had a seller. And I have two equal buyers, and one is putting ten thousand dollars on an EMD, and one's putting one thousand. I might suggest that we go with the ten, considering everything else is equal, which is very hard to measure. You know, but right. still, considering if everything else was equal, you would probably go with a higher deposit because it shows a little more seriousness. <laughs> I call that psychological warfare. Exactly, okay. yeah, it exactly. really is. Which, I mean, you know, which is valid, absolutely, yeah, because the the. If the buyer doesn't continue, doesn't go through with the transaction, most of the time they're going to get their money back. So what difference is it if I've got a thousand dollars as a buyer or a ten thousand dollars as a buyer? What? Because it's more money. I mean, it's I, the the well, the risk no. of losing that money is the same in either instance. But yeah, but it, it can also maybe reflect a buyer's buying power. How solid they are. Oh, no they doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's putting. <coughs> 50% down and somebody's struggling to get three and a half percent down on the, on the property. Yeah. You, you know, that this it, going through the rest of the process, the mortgage process, um, you know, that the guy putting or gal putting 50% down has a lot more likelihood of getting that mortgage through than the guy putting three, a girl, the guy or gal putting yeah. three and a half percent in. Yeah. Rob looks like he's got, it. yeah, we're that, that, <laughs> large deposit really does have teeth that was on a cash transaction. Oh, right? right. So cash, there's no contingency other than maybe a home inspection. So assuming you get through that home inspection, let me ask you a question. You have an offer accepted by a seller and somebody's got a thousand dollar EMD on whatever price tag you want to take 200 right. grand purchase price. <coughs> Buyer number two, same 200 grand, but has 10 grand. If you're the buyer and get cold feet, Right. Yeah, we all know seller can sue for, for, uh, for performance. Realistically, it's never going to happen. But the seller will be entitled to the EMD. So if you're the buyer with cold feet, are you willing to sacrifice a thousand bucks to right. walk away from the two hundred? Maybe. Yeah. How yeah, about two thousand? You're more likely to walk away yeah. from How about two thousand. Right. The, as the number goes up, you feel ten less. grand. You're going to walk away? Probably not. No. And again, a guy over cold feet over cold feet, like a, a well-off buyer might even walk away from 10 grand, right, right? right? So when it comes to that cash transaction, my argument on the selling side is I want a huge deposit. Right. Two reasons. Keeps them from walking away. We're closing in two, three weeks anyway. Buyers got to bring the total amount to closing. So what difference does it matter if we hold 50 grand of that 200 for the next two weeks? Well, Chuck and I have actually done that before. We gave full price as the EMD. 
Right. So because right. we knew we're buying it, and it's just a matter of two weeks, and here it is. There's you don't have to worry about us getting financed. You don't need proof of funds now. We gave you the entire amount as the EMD. Right. Funny right. that you say that. I had a multiple offer situation. I was the buyer's agent, good client and friend of mine, and he was buying the house for his son. Yeah. And that's what we did. The agent, listing agent, about fell out of her chair. <laughs> She's like, are, "Are you kidding me?" I was like. <laughs> They got to bring it to closing anyway. What difference? Yeah, what does difference make? if we write the check today or two weeks from now? Right. And it might have been a two thirty sales price, and he wrote two hundred as his EMD. Yeah, right. You know. Right. Yeah. No, it makes sense. But <clears throat> overall, for a buyer, especially in the seller's market that we're in now, in the lack of inventory, for a buyer to stand out in their offer, this is a tactic you can use. Like you said, psychological warfare. It's a head fake. Yeah. It's yeah. it's not. It does not mean that they're more qualified or less qualified or what it's just a a like rob said a psychological warfare to maybe get your buyer the deal because they're putting a bigger emd but you mentioned contingencies so in a typical offer there are two main contingencies one is going to be on financing and the other one is going to be on home inspection correct talk about that a little bit yeah you know i mean you tell, or at least I tell all buyers, listen, there is no way you can lose this EMD. Here's the circumstances. You make an offer contingent upon a home inspection, contingent upon mortgage approval. First thing, dissatisfied with home inspection, you're out if you want to be, and you get, get your, your money, money back. back. Through the home inspection, you're satisfied. Mortgage appraisal comes in, loan to value ratio is off. You don't want to adjust it. Seller doesn't want to adjust. You're out. You get, get your, your money, money back, back right? I said, appraisal's in, inspection was good, you get fired from your job the day before closing. Yeah. Part of the mortgage approval, right? Still have to be gainfully employed with no detriment Uh, to your income or credit. Get your money back. Get your money back. Right. Here's the thing, though. Now, the state somewhat ties our hands. Three scenarios. Yeah. Even when we say we know this buyer is entitled to their EMD back, The state says you have to have one of three things, three things only to release the EMD. Right. One, the closing of the transaction transaction. pursuant to the agreement. So it closes, EMD gets dispersed. A fully executed mutual release between buyer and seller stating who gets the EMD. Yeah, so who who could possibly get this EMD? Right. So they have to agree, yes, the buyer does get it. (laughs) They, even though we think buyer's 100% entitled to it, seller or their agent doesn't think so. They don't sign that mutual release. Right. EMD sits, sits where it sits. Just sits in the escrow account. Yep. Third scenario is the court orders it. So you interplead it with the court and they decide. Right. I've actually had attorneys send me threatening letters that they're going to sue me as the broker for not releasing the EMD. Right, which you don't have a say in. I saw you say counselor is you three ways. should know. Yeah. There's as the three ways. <laughs> and A, <laughs> we didn't close. B, I don't have a fully executed mutual release and I don't C, have any don't court, have order. court order. So right. if you want to get one of those three things, I'll do whatever one of those three things tells me to do. Okay, but one question is, like you just mentioned, um it dic- um, you can, the court can dictate or in a mutual release, the parties can agree where that EMD goes. It's not necessarily true that it'll just automatically go to the buyer either. It could go to the seller, to the buyer, maybe a mixture of both. It could go to the buyer's broker. It could go to the listing broker Absolutely. or a combination of all four. Whatever's c- contractually agreed Whatever, on. Uh, but yeah. those parties, buyer and seller, again, brokers are not to party agree. to it. So parties, buyer, seller have to agree how it's split. How it's split up. Yep. But does the do the brokers have a claim to, to any of it in the sense that they fulfilled their obligation? No. No. Okay, so it's because not. Because the EMD is for the parties to the contract. So buy-sell agreement, buyer-seller. Your buyer-broker agreement, assuming you represent the buyer, might indicate that you're to be compensated in some fashion based on you doing your okay. job. Separate issue, which or, brings up a good point. Or the listing contract may say, if the seller is to uh, receive any forfeited EMD, then the brokers will split it accordingly. Yeah. Some listing contracts oh, oh, will say oh, that. Oh, Mr. Cotter. Yeah. He brings up a point because <laughs> yeah. uh, in practice, if the broker got any of the EMD, 
you would see the brokers split the portion they got between, you know, oh. buying agent and listing agent. But if you really read the listing contract, who's the contract between? The listing broker seller, and the seller. Right. Seller and the listing broker. It right. says that the listing broker gets to keep that money. Right. It doesn't say that the listing broker has to split it. Right. With the buyer's agent. And that's not and the and only that's reason not in our MLS agreement. And the only no. reason it's done like that is because <coughs> the compensation agreement through the MLSs are typically a lot of times a 50-50 split between listing broker and right. selling broker. So that kind of in practice carries over to any refunded EMD. Right. Or, I, or I guess I'm talking about in the scenario where the uh, inspection contingency is cleared and passed. The uh, financing contingency is cleared and passed. You're on track. Some other reason, buyer just doesn't want any more. Cold feet. Change their mind, cold feet, whatever. So the EMD is up for grabs. Or well, the EMD the at that point, yes, the the buyer would be in a position to forfeit their deposit, right. forfeit their earnest money deposit. And that's the only scenario that's going to, is all those contingencies were met, then the buyer just at the last minute says, yeah, I changed my mind. Right. But and I guess they what walk I'm away from their EMD. They're walking, the buyer's walking away from it. But is the seller the only one with a claim to it at that point? Yes. And, and I'm asking that in the sense, I guess. Yes, maybe because the they're the only EMD, party to the contract. But what if now you argue that, hey, we had a contract that I was going to list your market for sale. I got you a qualified buyer and they did not back out because they didn't qualify. They didn't back out because of an inspection issue. I did what I was supposed to do, and I should get paid. No. Are you referring to yourself as the buyer's agent? No, as the listing agent. Well, you're wrong, because the uh, contract says I have to bring you a, a ready, willing, and able buyer to closing. Well, You're saying the, they're not the, willing the, anymore. The willing yeah. is yeah. not there. Because they've so backed out. So you didn't fulfill your end of the contract to <laughs> receive a commission. I see. So, um, but further in the listing contract, it'll say that you're entitled to 50% of whatever's collected is forfeited or right. earnest money deposit. You know, in the other scenario, though, the buyer's agent may be due a commission from their buyer's contract, and the buyer yes. brokerage may just use the EMD to fulfill that, but it's really being refunded to the buyer or and then being paid to you. It's not because it's, yeah. you're not in the contract in that. In well, the, and I think it's all into that mutual, you know, yeah. so those parties, buyer and seller agree. Yeah, here's what's fair, you know. Um, but I would say that really that buyer's agent's not entitled to They're anything. not entitled to the, yeah. Per the, the purchase agreement or per the listing contract, he's Correct. not entitled to anything. Or he or she's not entitled to anything. But per their buyer broker contract, they, they may be entitled be. to yeah. something. Separate issue. So, yeah, right. Totally yeah, separate issue. Different separate contract. But, you know, but, so. but it does seem kind of related because I will often um, recommend that my buyers put 3% as an EMD. And I, and I do <laughs> a that. A lot of agents do that. Yeah, and I do that it's for It's funny, it matches their commission. Commission <laughs> both, right? But it's, it's serious enough that it looks like you know, they're more serious to a seller and they feel a little bit more bound to it. And it covers my um, commission in case, you know, I had a claim to getting paid. I would want to do that. And Rick, referring to your 3%, realize again, it doesn't cover your commission because it's not your money. <laughs> right. It's going to go to the seller <laughs> right. first if there's a claim against right. that EMD. Right. So yeah, I know in practice is the money goes to the seller uh, to the seller's proceed, uh, yeah, to the seller's out of the buyer's proceeds goes to the seller. The seller is paying the listing broker a commission. The listing broker is then paying the buyer broker a commission. So that it's not really the EMD matching up really doesn't mean anything. It's just feels nice and packaged. Right. <laughs> Let's talk about who holds the EMD and who can hold uh, the EMD, right? So in tradition, traditionally, we have the buyer, we put it in our trust account. Right. There's nothing that prevents a listing agent saying any EMDs will be held by the listing broker. Yeah. And again, the same rules are going to apply. It doesn't mean they can just go up. Oh, we're not giving it back to the buyer. You still have that mutual release, but it does put you in more of a control position. 
And then I've also seen other brokers because of the government of that trust account, right? Yeah. The state of Michigan, courts, attorneys threatening to sue, all of those other little nuances. Yeah. They're going, I don't want a trust don't account. Even want it. You oh, hold yeah. it or, or give it to the title company. They give it company. to a third party. They give it yeah. to the title company or in some yeah, states, a lawyer. Online. There's lawyers, there's online companies, there's, <laughs> right. you know, there's different. We've people. thought about doing it because it's, it's sometimes when there's a disagreement, that money becomes this focal point of the parties fighting, right? And then you having control over it or being in your trust account, you get put in the middle. Right, and, and, and also there's rules about how to handle it and violating those rules under, and you get audited, you're in trouble for nothing. And right. really, when you do get audited, number one thing they look at is the, the trust money, right. the earnest money right. deposit. They really don't go through your transaction with a fine tooth comb and make sure everything was signed and blah, blah, blah. They want to know that you took someone's money and that money got used for that transaction and got deposited got timely deposited timely and I know you follow all the rules with right. that money so it yeah it, i mean that, that actually not up having a, a uh, not having a trust account for a small brokerage kind of makes sense let it, let the title company hold it let that's that somebody it. else yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. that actually else brings up issues. a point that i always whenever i write an offer for my buyers i always make sure to mention to them you're going to give me this check we are going to deposit. It's going to get cashed and held in our account. So it don't be surprised because I think sometimes buyers think, oh, I gave you that check as a deposit. You're supposed to hold it. No, 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 no. <laughs> we don't hold the check. We are holding it. We deposit, we're holding yeah. the cash. Yeah, we deposit We're not, the we're not check. holding the check. Right. Rick, you know? and I swear, it doesn't matter how many times you tell them that, they never hear it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. get the text. Hey, they cashed that check. Yeah, yeah. No yeah I know. No Look kidding. The previous text message. Yes, it will be deposited. No right. kidding. You know, Nobody right. ever remembers. Right. But <clears throat> the thing that's kind of uh, interesting to me is I was looking at our purchase agreement and I don't remember what I've seen on other people's purchase agreements. And ours is pretty standard. I mean, it's got a few little changes, but um, it says in here that it's going to be deposited in the form of a check. Could be wire, could be cash, could, could be. It could be, but what do you do when the contract says one thing? Do you? Well, and I, I, w I would say that that's semantics, really. You okay. Know? Um, and maybe we should look at updating that. Things have changed, and a lot of people. Well, not wire, necessarily ACH Venmo, deposit. But, you know, some sort, some sort of, of electronic funds yeah. transfer of that EMD. Right. And there's nothing that prevents us from taking cash. However, when it is cash and somebody's getting in a mortgage, the bank needs to verify. Right. But yeah, you know, let's just the say they didn't trail. have a checkbook. Right. And they could go to the bank and still withdraw money in the form of cash and it could go back in and they could show that paper trail. More work on the buyer's part to do that. But yeah, why not just get a cashier's yeah. check if you're there? Right. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking that we could update it with a checkbox or something. It's Wire, Cash, check, Venmo, whatever, Zell, what have you? E payment. You know, e -payment. probably worth mentioning. We had a, a transaction very recently here in the office where we had represented the buyer, and it was a you know fairly expensive house in excess of five hundred thousand, might have been six hundred thousand, and the EMD we were holding was twenty grand. Yeah, and uh, you know it was almost adversarial from day one negotiating the price. The sellers were non negotiable. Buyers moved forward. Um, had the home inspection, everything, whatever, again, decided to move forward. And uh, now we get down to the appraisal, and the loan to value was whacked. Mm. Uh, the loan wasn't going to be approved. So, in essence, the buyer's mortgage was denied because they couldn't come up with the extra money to buy the house, and the seller wasn't moving on the price. Uh. So, the buyer wanted to continue looking, send over a mutual release to get them their 20 grand released, which they were clearly entitled to. And the seller comes up with the story now of, well, during the home inspection, you broke my refrigerator. Oh, so wow. I want the 20 grand. <clears throat> well, first and foremost, it was never mentioned after the home inspection, right. only once the house didn't appraise. Right. And 20 grand for a refrigerator, even though it was a sub zero, but it was like a 30 year old sub zero right. refrigerator. Which would have been 10, maybe. You know, right, and right. it's like 20 grand. <clears throat> and the last thing is, the earnest money has nothing to do with that scenario. Right, right, right. You know, right. but that seller was digging their heels in and the buyer, you know, had to get an attorney involved oh, to get it released. Yeah. And it's just funny 
how people's perception of what that money is used for. Right. right. And, you know, here's the other thing about keeping the earnest money deposit. So if, if we have a, a, a seller and a buyer, they put buyer puts earnest money deposit and there's a, there's an issue on the transaction and each party won't give up on the trans, you know, they, right. they want the earnest money deposit back and they want seller wants to keep the earnest money deposit. Right. And I've had bank clients want to do that, keep right. the earnest money deposit. Well, the property is actually negatively affected by that earnest money deposit. In so this, in the sense that you're tied up and you can't. Exactly. Be okay, yeah. So if, if the seller says, okay, I want to keep the earnest money deposit. So I'm not signing the mutual release. Ah, right. And by the way, I want to sell it to the next guy. Yeah. Well, hold, hold on. You really can't because you're still under contract with right. the first people and no judge or anybody has decided that that contract is void. Yeah. So you still have a valid contract. So it's negatively affected by that purchase agreement and subsequent earnest money deposit. So <coughs> it's, it's just not a game that you want to play. You want to, you want to just release the money, get, get these people out of the deal if you can. And I, like I told you, we had a conversation on this the other day is I don't want their their thousand dollar earnest money right. deposit. I want the six hundred thousand dollars that they were paying for the house. Right. So I want the full enchilada, not just the earning yeah. EMD. I mean, if you're not, if it doesn't, if the deal doesn't work, get out of the deal. Yeah, I go mean, somewhere that, else. That's actually great advice for agents because we often get caught up in. We think we're being warriors for our clients, but actually we might be hindering them or hurting them in the exactly. process. So you got to be very aware of. How do I get this to move forward? Get the, remove the obstacle rather than, you know, headbutting your way through it. Well, and Rick, you're, you're so right. It's nobody, no court's ever going to force some buyer to buy. That's never going to happen. Right. They're probably not going to force a seller to sell. I've never seen that happen. Yeah. So yeah. best case scenario is you're getting earnest money. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what that amount is. To Chuck's point, 600 grand, even if it's 10 grand. Yeah. You don't, 10 grand's no consolation when you don't get your 600. Right. It's just not. Especially when you have plans where you might be going and you might be, right? So it's a, it's a huge mess now. Best thing you can do, release. Release the money, get on with your life. Exactly. Because here they think, okay, I sell it to the second party. I've actually done this for buyers. You don't want to sign the mutual release, giving the EMD back to the buyer. We'll file an affidavit of interest on the property. Now, now that now seller sells sell it, it to, to the next party and they get title work and knowing who the title company was the first time around, I'll call that title company and say, by the way, we just filed an affidavit of interest on that property. So you may want to update your title commitment. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Yeah. So best thing is to avoid the mess. Be reasonable. Exactly. Be reasonable. You know, you know. And and again, uh, in our business as agents and brokers, our job is to is to manage expectations. Manage expectations for those buyers. Manage expectations for those sellers. And, you know, be the voice of reason in the deal, you know, um, so that, yeah, you, you, you have a right to go after that earnest money deposit as the seller. But if if uh you know it's it's not it's not worth it most of the time right let me ask you guys this if i have an earnest money deposit i put with an offer and that doesn't get accepted but we have already deposited the emd um does it have to go back to the buyer or can the buyer keep it with the brokerage for the next property that they write an offer on absolutely absolutely you can yeah. keep it with the brokerage and then the next pro or here Great example. Uh, back years ago, uh, my business partner that I, I work with and I sell, has sold a lot of houses with, um, we, I told her, hey, why don't we just collect the earnest money deposit up front, up front when we sign the buyer broker contract? Right. And she fought with me. Oh, they'll never do that. They'll never <laughs> do that. Right. The very next buyer, I said, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I went and I collected the earnest money deposit with the buyer broker contract signature. Right. And, it, and it was 3%. It did match my commission at the time. Yeah. And my buyer broker contract said that I can keep that money and I can use the money and I, I can collect it as commission right now and you do not get it back. Yeah. Okay. The lady never bought a house. We ended up giving her the you know, earnest back. money back to right. her, but I didn't have to legally. Right. Um, but my point was we took the earnest money deposit before we ever had a property. Right. 
So it's in there so that the buyer, we didn't have to scramble when we were right. writing the contract. And this happens we all had the time. It. We scramble. You know, at the we lesson. already had it. Uh, the funds were already in our account. And I signed, it, it's, there's a spot on our contracts that says the broker is signing for the earnest yeah. money deposit, yep. which brings me to another point. But we'll come back. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we had collected it early and we only assigned it to a property once we had an, would have had an offer accepted. I mean, it seems very reasonable to do that, actually. Absolutely. If you're doing a buyer broker contract with your client and they're serious, might as well just take it. Because I've had it happen where I'm writing an offer Sunday night, you know, and I got to submit this offer. The buyer's sending me a copy of the check that they're using as EMD. But I'm not picking it up until tomorrow morning. But in the rush to try to get everything done and get it over to the listing agent because you have a deal. You know, and it has a cash we check. We're it. signing for it that we received yeah. it, but it never cashed. Right. So we had this scenario before where um, somebody gave us an earnest money deposit. It was going to be a quick deal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like a cash or it something. Was a, it like, was a cash, it was a cash deal. Yeah. And uh, the check bounced. Well, uh, the closing is two weeks from now. The check fully cashing and getting into our account is 10 days from now, 10 business right. days. So really, those time frames were really tight. Well, the earnest money deposit ended up bouncing yeah. three times. Oh, so geez. we it bounced. I think the person wrote us another check. or, or Yeah, so he did the sorry, wrong account, got yeah, confused. Yeah. Wrote us another check. That one bounced. Oh, wow. They redeposited. That one bounced. He so, disappeared. Right. So now he's supposed to close. So now the, the, we signed for the earnest money deposit that, right. that we had it and they were taking us to court saying, Hey, you signed and said you had the earnest money deposit. So yeah. we, because we signed for it because we did have the check, but we did not have the funds in our account. I see. So collecting that money up front at the buyer broker contract would be the smartest thing to do. You know, and, and to piggyback on that story, Chuck, here's the thing. The guy, the seller, takes us to court. Now, Rick, this was before, it was I'll say before it was before 08. email and stuff. I mean, it just emailed certainly way before texting because yeah. there was faxes and things of that nature. I, mean, uh -huh. I know we yeah. have cell phones. What are those? But <laughs> was there, did you drive to work on a dinosaur? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Fred Flintstone pedal in the car. <laughs> Stone wheels on the car. Yeah, exactly. You know. um, Wilma. But the buyer's agent was notified via okay. a phone call. Right. So his client sues the brokerage. We get into court and the judge told that seller, hey, I, you know, feel for you, but you are suing the wrong person. Right. You can sue the buyer if you can find them, but yeah. it's not their fault that the check bounced. They did what they were supposed to do. Right. So we think we're golden. I don't know, a month or so later, you get a letter for the state to appear in front of the licensing oh, stuff. Because that guy turned us into the state saying that, that mishandling we, we mishandled the EMD. And here's the saddest part. So we have to go tell the story again to our benefit was, to the state. Hey, this guy already sued us in court. Right. And here's and what lost. the judge yeah, said. Like he lost. Double jeopardy. And the state agreed still with the, the court ruling, but still find us, meaning F-I-N-E-D. Yeah. Find fine. us yeah. for not having any way to prove that we told the seller's agent that the EMD Oh, bounced. wow. Okay. I'm like, how are we supposed to do it? Right. I mean, and again, back before emails. Today, you'd send an email, you'd have a transaction history, or you'd right. have a, a thread right. on the transaction. From a legal point of view, they're saying, oh, well, you send a certified letter, you know, or something. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And but, they, they had, at the time, had suggested, well, you should have sent a letter, put together a letter, yeah. and faxed it to them. Yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah. really? Yeah. So we got like a $250 fine. Oh, my God. And then if you looked up my license at the time, and it might still be there, there was like a, a ding, like mishandling of earnest money deposit. Yeah, which sounds really scary. Yeah, so if you're a consumer and see that about me, you're going, oh, yeah. this guy's crooked, right? Right, right and, right. and that's what it was about. And it's just, I was really disappointed in the state on how they handled that, but they did it to pacify a consumer. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a tough, 
That's a tough one because clearly it's not your fault that his check was bad. Yeah. <laughs> right. The buyer literally disappeared. Nobody got paid. He didn't buy the property. We didn't get paid. You know, and again, we didn't take the buyer's money. Yeah. The only other thing about the EMD and the signature on that, you know, so um, on our purchase agreements, there is a spot there where the broker has to sign yep. for, or the agent has to sign for the earnest money deposit that they collected it. Yeah, it says okay. acknowledgement of earnest money deposit received by the office name. And then agent, the agent's and then name a and then a signature. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a practice out there in the, in the industry that other offices will ask for a copy of the check. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm not giving you the copy of the check. I don't want to get, I, I signed on the purchase agreement that says I received that. So right. what you're saying is you don't believe me. You need other proof. Right. Oh, you know, and then it's my office manager needs this, what have you. I mean, it's, it's all BS, you know, it's just not, um, it's their policy <coughs> and they don't even know the, you know, they, nobody's even looked at the purchase agreement. If you look right. at that purchase agreement, it's pretty clear. I received the EMD and I signed for it. And yeah. receiving a copy of the check doesn't tell you anything still. Just like, in yeah, it doesn't say that it's cash. Yeah. Just like you just said, this whole story it's still you sitting could, in my desk drawer. Yeah. Or it, there was no funds and yeah, it was a it bad bounced, check. Whatever. What so, is good is it to have a copy of the check in that point? You know, what's funny too on that check, a lot of title companies will do that. Mm. You do know, you a copy of the EMD? Hey, did, did you receive that check? Purchase agreement says I did. Yeah. What difference does it make? Well, the balance of my money too, right? That's taken into consideration. I'm holding that money. So who am I? True. Who am I shorting if I really don't have the money? Oh, that's right. true. Now right. lenders will sometimes ask <coughs> because the lender, obviously giving a mortgage to the buyer, the borrower. Yeah. Maybe they have to have so much of their money into the transaction. So let's just say there was a way. Uh, for me to collude with a buyer going, hey, I'll save you five, seven grand. Your buyer, your lender thinks I'm holding seven grand of your money and you're my best friend. I don't need a commission or I don't right. need the full commission. I sign saying I've got the seven grand. They don't verify that. Yeah. You're good to the tune of seven grand that I don't have. Or but you even right. verifying it means you're getting a copy of the deposited check. Because you can't not necessarily. No, I, mean, I mean, our office, our office manager will send a basically a, the, a the, letter. Uh, yeah, it's our what we use as a trust deposit card. They'll send the card, say you know the number, the check number, and you know but like a little that, statement. How is it any different than it's signing not? The PA, it's though. not. That's so why that's I tell you saying, this. This practice is stupid. But I'm saying the only way to <laughs> okay. actually verify it would be we need a copy of the yeah. Cash see the check. bank statement. Yeah, that shows copy of the check, the bank statement, yeah. the deposit ticket. You know, I Which mean, no yeah, they really are better off going to the buyer to say I can get yes. from your bank yeah. a copy yeah. of that the, cashed yes. check, right? Payable to Remax Metropolitan, right. right? Example, and that makes more sense. It's all the finances. That are related to the buyer. Right. Why yeah. they ask us though, I, I really <laughs> don't understand. Stupid. And then if somebody were to do what I described in that example, hey, I, you know, I wrote it as if I received seven grand, but really didn't. Right. It, you know, I'd be committing loan fraud. Exactly. And I, I'd exactly. be messing with the state on what's being told that's going into the trust account versus what actually went into the trust account. And again, that's so. really the, the the focus of their audit most of the time is the earnest money deposits. So in that instance, they'd look at that purchase agreement and say, okay, where's the seven grand? It's yeah. not there. You know, so not only would that be loan fraud, it would be also fraud against be jeopardizing the license, your license against you know. the state. So yeah, let me yeah. tell you guys, uh, this is a story. This happened maybe almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago. I had a buyer that wrote an offer. They really liked the house. We wrote an offer. <clears throat> they got it accepted and they did a $5,000 EMD. The Purchase on the house was like 400 okay? Um, we do the home inspection, and everything checks out except for on the exterior near the, the, um, near the ground level by one of the basement windows. There was like you know, the step, step crack, crack in the crack mortar. In the yep, mortar. In the mortar. Yeah. And Need a tuck pointing. the idiot inspector that they hired that was the cheap. We talked about this in the previous um episode they hired budget the, inspectors they, yeah. and he ended up being like 15 dollars cheaper than the people i had recommended yeah, joe's pretty good inspection company Sometimes. he flagged it as could be a foundation issue 
Could be, but it could it could be most but, likely it's frost or you know it was, but it was clear to me. I tried to explain it to them, and they were nervous. Okay, but what I think was really happening is they got cold feet, and I said, "Look, I'll, I'm going to call my inspector friend to come look at this. Just take a look at it, and give me a second opinion as a favor." They said, "Okay, do that." So he comes and looks at it, and he says, "Oh yeah, this is nothing." He has just tuck point tuck pointing, tuck pointing, have a nice day. He goes, it's not, he goes, this isn't even the foundation. He goes, this is just a brick facade anyway. He right. goes, so there's nothing going on here. He goes, there's no water. There's no evidence of anything. So I tell them that and they're like, oh, okay. So the next day I, I get the, they believed them. Yeah. <laughs> the next day they call me, they say, uh, look, we had a family financial emergency and we need to back out of this deal. I go, oh, geez. I go, okay, what you need to do is, cause I knew. <laughs> I sensed it, right? I was like, what you need to do is contact your lender right now and get him to send the letter saying that he cannot approve you because you had this financial emergency. It, and he's like, oh, um, I have to call the lender? I go, yeah, he has to say that he, you're not approved now because you, you don't have the money because you gave your money to your family member. He's like, okay. So the next day, the lender calls me. He goes, hey, what's going on on this? And I tell him, I'm like, oh, they said they had a financial family emergency and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, that's it's he, not really the truth. Not really he, the truth. he goes, I, I don't think that's what's going on here. He goes, they just asked me to write a letter saying that, you know, uh, that they're denied for the they're mortgage. denied for the mortgage. And I can't do that. And I was like, well, yeah, of course you can't do that. You can't just lie. Why? So. I call him back and I say, this is the deal. I go, if you back out of this house now, the lender is not going to write that letter for you. You're going to back out. You lose the $5,000. Because they were beyond their home inspection, home inspection time frame? Home okay. inspection. The, that was, I already, wasn't clear about in the story. They had, they had already um, been okay with it. They, they just got a doubt about it later. Okay. And I think they were just using that excuse. That's why I had somebody else go look at it and be like, hey, that was not a problem, was it? Right, right. <clears throat> and... Um, turns out they, uh, they gave up the 5,000. I mean, I, th and, and honestly, if they had bought that house, so a year later, just a few months ago, they bought a house, a hundred thousand dollars more further out than where they wanted to be. And I was like, you guys could have bought the same house for a hundred thousand dollars cheaper. Instead, it cost you a hundred and five thousand right. dollars. <laughs> Right, plus increased taxes because of the value. Value, and, right, you know, right, right. On interest yeah. rates are up, and it's not exactly where they wanted yeah. to be. The other one was. <coughs> so anyway, uh, trust your professional. Yes, and you know, like th these rules are in place, and I think sometimes we don't do a good job of explaining it to our. Because I thought about it a lot later. I was like, what was wrong with the way I explained it to them? Because I, you know, I tried to be you know, educational about these things. Like this is what to expect next. This is what's coming up. This is how this Again, is going to Managing work. expectations. Yes, exactly. But I guess sometimes these things get through the cracks and then people start to get clever. And when they get clever, <laughs> you know, they're causing bigger problems than is necessary. By the way, that seller of that first house, the one where they did this, um, he was a uh, um, ex-police officer and he was very meticulous about his house. He had security cameras. God, I remember that story. Yeah, and and he was livid. He was livid that they were back because it was a done deal for him, and now they had to right. start all over. Right, right. So, yeah, and I think that people and that word, back to the deposit, right, earnest money. Mm -hmm. It means that you're supposed to be acting in earnest, in good faith. Guard, when you bargaining in good faith, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so these cold feet, mom and dad's opinion, all these other things that make you change your mind, you don't realize the effect that it has. Yeah. And I get on, it. You're looking out people. for your own right. interest, right? But the other people, those sellers and what their plans are, and maybe it's the seller of the house they bought. And oh, then, yeah. Oh, and I've on, seen that right. a hundred right. times you know. where it was a, a domino effect. Okay. So, and it's usually the, the cheapest house that screws up the whole, the whole chain, chain yeah. you know, so you can't buy that one. So therefore this guy can't buy that one and that guy can't buy that one and that guy can't move out of state, you yeah. know? So, 
Yeah, um, the lack of regard for other people involved is, you know, it's, it's when, a shame. When, you know, you're 18 years old, you're le- legally able to sign a contract. When you sign those contracts, they should mean something. It means something. You right. know, uh, it, just like we've said for years, those all of those items on the purchase agreement mean something. Right. Okay. You're agreeing to this. You're agreeing to this. You're agreeing to a closing date. You're agreeing to this. You know, they're not suggestions. Right. Those are firm dates and we are doing everything now. Occasionally you can't hit a, a date, but you know, you are bargaining in good faith means you're going to do everything you said you were going to do legally yeah. and, and put it on paper and, and, you know, and like, you know, the focus of this t- yeah. talk is the e- earnest money deposit. So, and I think another thing to note is, especially for agents, we've talked about this with our agents. Our agents are all pretty good about this now, at least. <laughs> um, but these timelines that are in place, by the state on how to handle the EMD. Rob, why don't you kind of explain what those You know, are? and I think we discussed this in a previous podcast. And it, it, I will say, owning the brokerage, it still is probably the biggest issue that we have with agents, no matter how many times you discuss it. The broker, once they have that earnest money, yeah, we can hold it indefinitely until two days of a final accepted offer okay. between the parties. Weekends do not count. Okay, so just to explain that. Banking days. It's okay, two yeah. banking days. But just to explain that scenario, um, buyer writes an offer. I, I'm the buyer's agent. I write up the offer. Buyer signs it. Gives me the EMD. We send our offer to the seller. And let's say we have two weeks going of back and forth negotiations before we get a bottom line final signed uh, purchase agreement. I'm the agent. I got that on the first day one, but it took two weeks. So I have to what? I have to give it to my broker. You have to give it to you immediately. 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 And it's going to get deposited. Well, not. it no. doesn't have to. That is the point, and I think that's where the confusion comes in. So like we talked about earlier in this conversation, where buyers think you're going to hold it, I, as the broker, can hold it indefinitely without depositing it. Until the two once, weeks the, the deal gets Once we have a meeting of the minds, buyer and seller have totally agreed. Yes. I, as the broker, now only have two days. Two days. Weekends don't count. So let's just say Two the deal comes days. together Friday at five. Yeah. It's got to be in by Tuesday at five. Right. Provided Monday's not a holiday. So, yes. you know, Weekends it's, and it's, holidays, it's yes. two banking days. So two right. banking days from seller's acceptance. So, well, buyer and seller's meeting of the minds or agreement on the purchase agreement. Now, agents, again, yeah, checks in your possession, goes to the broker. Yeah. Period. That's it. Period. Here's the problem <coughs> when it comes in. Okay. You got the check. Let's just say same scenario. Friday at five, you grab a check and you give it to us on Monday. Yes, nobody's going to really know the broker didn't have possession when you had possession Friday. Right, right. We're still going to make our timelines or you do it Tuesday morning. You do it Tuesday at six o'clock. Too late. Too late. And you can't correct it. Right. Okay, wait, what do you mean by you can't? Because this, this happens all the time. People try to do... You can't lie. No, no, no. <laughs> How do agents try to correct it then? Well, they'll just say, um, just go ahead and deposit it. The problem with that is if we, Chuck and I, get audited and they see that timeline and they grab that file... We're in violation. We're in violation. Law. It's a but day late. And they don't care. What they I don't was, care what the excuse is. So the contract is. was nope. signed on the 5th. We didn't deposit it till the 8th. We're in violation. Right, but what, I you guess know. what I was getting at is... You'll see people, they got the check um, two days later. Now it's already late. We're past the time. I give you the check and then you tell me, oh, this is too late. So I go back with an uh, amendment Can't do saying it. that, hey, we all agree that we're going to deposit it <laughs> Can't tomorrow. Can't do it. Can't, not supposed you, to do that. You cannot no, do no, that. No, cannot do it. No. Yeah, the only thing that you no. could, could do to remedy that would be write the whole contract. Whole thing over. <laughs> re yeah. re in, uh with new, dates. new dates. Engineer it backwards with new dates. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And you got to get the seller to agree and the buyer's Everybody agent to agree. To, you know. So it's it's just it, again, which feels it's not the right that. way to do it. The right, right way to do it is to write the contract, give the check to the broker, broker deposits the check within the time frame, and everybody's happy. Right. Right. Now you could do, and I've stressed to the agent, listen, 
then don't take a check. You could write the contract to read something to the effect of the earnest money deposit will be delivered to the selling broker within 48 hours or so you could say two within weeks. two weeks yeah. of a final acceptance by as the long parties. as that's in the initial agreement. Correct. Because now the same thing's going to apply. Right. If we're up to that two week last day deadline, that agent grabs that check, immediately goes to the broker. Brokers in receipt of the money. Yes. We now have two, two days to get it days. to the bank. Yeah. Right. Okay. Banking uh, days. Yeah. Holidays, weekends excluded. Right. Um, does the brokerage have to return the EMD in the same format it was received. Like we talked about earlier, maybe someone gave you cash or somebody wired the money. Um, is the brokerage required to pay back in the same format? Or no, can, so. there's nothing in state law that says that. Right. So yeah, we you know, have a check, we, you'll get it. You, I mean, you, you know, we, we collect cash and you get a check or a lot of the online know. things like a wire and stuff have yeah. other fees associated with them. Right. Stuff like that. Right. Too. I mean, you know, if we can do that and, <coughs> and, you know, they ACH it in and wanted ACH out, we can, we can probably do that, but typically we're just going to write a check, right? you know, right. um, cause that's how we've done it for years. And, uh, kind of to wrap this up now, um, from what we talked about in the beginning, we mentioned that you don't have to do an EMD, right? And that it's not really a part of what the agreement is, like the fundamentals of what the agreement is. Like you said, you have to have- Offer, acceptance, offer and consideration. And consideration. Um, but if we are going to do EMDs, we want to follow certain best practices and rules. Well, how about state law? State law. State, state <laughs> yeah. law. It's not a make it up as yeah, you go yeah, it's kind not of thing. A, it's not an option. It's, you know- the, the state it, says this. If we want to, it's not a suggestion. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the state will definitely let you know that it's not a suggestion. Right. <laughs> right. So, but uh, like you said, uh, an agent should hand it over immediately to the broker, and then the broker follows the state. It's Correct. Just, it's the easiest thing to think of. If you just remember the word immediately, oh, I got somebody's check. Here you go, Chuck. Here yeah. you go, Rob. Here you go, Helga. And yeah. I'd rather deposit the money and have to give the guy his money back right. if the deal doesn't go through than to have the, the check in somebody's drawer or in their glove box or, you know, we're in a file folder, you know, <coughs> I, I mean, it, it, I know it's a pain in the neck to tr give a guy his, uh, his EMD back because we have to wait 10 days for the check for the to clear. clear right. Then we can write him his money back, you know, so right. it, it's, uh, and plus we try to make it easy for our agents now that maybe, um, our more mobile agents or work from home agents, We've got options for them to be able to deposit the check themselves and then notify us that it's been done so that we can you know, right. make There's, sure our paperwork you know, is complete. Chase bank on every corner so yeah. um, we can do it right. that way. Anything else you guys want to add? I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, the only other thing that you said we, where we talked about no EMD is required, it's just to write it up that way. Yeah. You know, you're not going to be taken seriously. Well, and okay, so <laughs> I, I, could, I could tell you this though. When it's a buyer's market, like the foreclosure stuff that we went through, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, um, you could write zero dollar EMDs because they were so happy to get the offer. <laughs> you know, it's often under asking. There may be an EMD, maybe not. Um, buyers pretty much had the power to structure their offer the way they wanted, but that is not in the a, case in, today. Yeah, in yeah. a balanced market or in a in a, uh, a buyer's market, absolutely. I mean, my uncle used to work represent uh, one of the largest builders in the '80s, yeah. and he would routinely write up million dollar deals with a thousand dollar refundable earnest money deposit. Right. So if I don't like the wetlands, I don't like this, I don't like that, I get my thousand dollars back. So he's t literally tying up millions yeah, right. if not tens of millions of dollars worth of real estate a thousand for two thousand yeah. dollars now he had the power of at the time the largest builder in the united states behind him but that was how we structured it rob and i built a building on hall road here and same thing i wrote the offer that way really? and the guy told me to go take a flying yeah. leap you know <laughs> he wasn't having that we were laughing but we're trying to do our like hey we're brokers no emds required he's like i don't care yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't having it he wanted us to have skin in the game yeah, yeah. so but you couldn't even write it. that kind of offer today no yeah. well man, not, i don't know about commercial but not residential yeah. right you couldn't not even. residential and not with a residential real estate agent on the other side of right, it you know right. i know that the earnest money deposit is 
not required. It's not, it's, you're going to get it back. So it doesn't really matter if there's a thousand or a hundred thousand in right. EMD because it's not really at risk. But, um, you know, the, the other real estate agent on the other side sees a big, huge EMD. They're going to go, Oh, yeah. That's, our, that's our buyer. Yeah, and that's you know. the key. That's what, like you said, so, psychological, psychological warfare. warfare brings yeah. us right back to the beginning of this <laughs> yeah. conversation. Exactly. And I do so. feel that for sure. Is like if I'm the listing agent and I see small EMD, I'm going to, this person's got no skin in the game. It's like I'd gladly, you know, if I was buying a $700,000 house, I got cold feet, 10 grand, not happy about losing it, but yeah. would I walk away? Probably. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Knowing yeah. that's really their only recourse. You're not but if suing you had me and winning. 21,000. That three <laughs> percent. I don't know. You even that, when you think of, let's just say somebody like in your story that you were told they had some big financial burden. Oh, that, right. You know, I've got money to buy a seven hundred thousand dollar house, but now I got to use that money elsewhere, and I got to sacrifice twenty one grand. But that's you know, I'm no. Up, but even in that scenario, you, know, you wouldn't have been approved, and you'd have the financing out. The problem here was they were lying. They yeah, were but, lying, right. and but, the lender said, "I can't just say that in a letter." Yeah, I, you know, you right. have the money there. You're not and didn't go anywhere. Cold feet in this case cost them five grand. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think but, it depends on the level of your buyer, the financial stability of your buyer. What's going to make it sting a little bit to keep them from getting exactly. cold feet? Right. right. Yeah. They're well, and that's going to be know, a different number there for are, everybody. There are millionaires that won't walk away from a thousand bucks. Yeah. You know, and then there are other people that aren't so well uh, financed that that will walk away from 10 grand. So it's yeah, because if a seller sued you, right, and you've got five grand. You know, you might spend in excess of that five right. grand to defend in, yourself. In legal fees, yeah, it. yeah. So you might be better off going goodbye to the five time and is I'm out. Yeah, time is money and you might as well just let it go. Yeah, most most lawsuits are not that. Most lawsuits are, I'm going to stand up on my principles. <laughs> principles. You, know, you know who taught me not to? <laughs> this guy right here. <laughs> well, because a real estate. Because it lack of principles? Or no, what? no, no, no. A real estate <laughs> uh, trainer, coach yeah. that we know. Very well. Yeah. Uh, we both took brokers like class, classes from her. She spent eighteen thousand dollars once to win six. Yeah. Oh my god! To me, but she yeah. was that, right. Damn it! Yeah, yeah. And, but that math doesn't work and doesn't make sense. It's like right. I. I know I'm right, so I'm not going to spend the 18 to, to save six. I'll just lose the six and call it a day. Yeah, you know? uh, I mean, I can't believe I'm about to quote Dr. Phil on this, but uh, Dr. Phil always says this about like arguments and stuff. He's like, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? <laughs> exactly. You, know, you got to well, choose sometimes and move right. on. And that is what I learned from Chuck because to prove you're right, I mean, it, sometimes it feels good, but – when you're looking in Lori's example, you know, I know I'm right. I'm in real estate and I'm entitled to that six grand, but I'm going to spend 18 to get six. Yeah. That's poor business decision making. Right. right? The only thing w that I would do that for is if you were trying to set a precedence and you were, you were, you know, and that's what all these laws are is one precedent you know, sets for the next time and so forth. So, um, you know, the other thing, it, there might be a it, reason though, to do it but in the meantime, most of the time. No. However, you as a human are processing that aggravation. Yeah. You know, if you're laid back about it, eh, this doesn't bother me. No, and I'm stress. spending money. Yeah. And, but me, all of that just builds up <laughs> and <laughs> preoccupies my thoughts. Me too. It's yeah. better to just go goodbye to the money. And it's hard to say that because that, way of thinking almost promotes the lawsuits. Well, it's, yeah, it's like all these lawsuits yeah, that are there. Yeah, because it just encourages them. Right. Saying, it's yeah. like all these lawsuits that these TV lawyers will will bring on. A lot of it gets settled just to make it go away. Right. You know, not that they're, they're right and they're wrong. It just <clears throat> gets settled to go away, yeah. you know. It's almost like, you know, if you're in business, you run that risk every time you get out of bed. <laughs> yeah. So it's just the the sooner you can get your head wrapped around, you know, it might be an expense to do business, right or wrong. You know what? Right. You let it, you and of let course, it. we're always right. <laughs> you can let I was, the money I was go. wrong once when I thought I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. You can let the money go and then you can also make a decision. I will never, ever, ever do business with that person again. You know, and, and you're... Or... And, it's all a learning experience. You know, I sure. mean, I, I, I've bought refrigerators or stoves 
you know, for because your client. for my client yeah. because of a mistake I made right. or I've, you know, done this wrong or a mistake. I've done it to get my commission. Yeah. <laughs> well, that too, okay. that too. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, if it's just part of doing business is, yeah. uh, you know, the path of least resistance and, and getting things done. Sometimes as long you have as to, you learn from it, right? That absolutely. Saying, education isn't, a, is you know, expensive. isn't cheap. Expensive. Is expensive. Cheap. And, and I guarantee you that issue that I had with the, the, what was it? Range slash oven or, or, or range comma oven that cost me an oven. Oh. I will never, ever in my life ever make that mistake again. Right. It will never happen. So it was, you know, so it was wait, probably $600 so at happened. the time. You had range comma oven, and they saw that as two items instead of a range slash oven, which would have been one item. Is that? Yes, right? it yeah. was something like that. And yeah. I, I, it's been a long time, but it was basically, <laughs> I didn't read it properly. It said comma or slash yeah. or, or hyphen. And, uh, yeah. I ended up buying a stove <laughs> and, uh, you know, Funny, it won't happen again. It, I do remember this, and I can't remember which agent. It was, I think, last summer where she had sold her buyer a home that was tenant occupied. And she wrote, you know, kitchen, stove, refrigerator, whatever. Oh, Now, the appliances that were in the kitchen were owned by that tenant. tenant. Yeah, uh, I remember that. So the seller was providing kitchen stove refrigerator, yeah. but they weren't the pretty stainless steel ones she saw. Oh, wow. And the agent made the mistake of not using the language as viewed. As viewed. And right. she's like, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And I said, <laughs> now I know who it is too. I said, you're buying a stove and refrigerator. Yeah. It's your fault. You made the mistake. Yeah. Education is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> But you can't, you can't back somebody when they're wrong. You know, as the broker, when you know right and wrong from experience, yeah. right? He's bought refrigerators. He's bought stoves. We've all done something. We've yeah, all done on the mistake. Know. But admit it. Yeah, just admit, admit it. Like, okay, this was a learning experience. I'll right. never make that mistake again. Right. You know, but shame on you. You should have found out. Hey, the appliances that we see, those. Those are the ones we're talking about, right? right. Or as or, viewed. Or I'll put like the appliances in the property at the show, at, at the yeah. day of the showing, 520. See pictures you attached. Know, or, you know. or I'll, you know, the date we showed it so that I know that that's, that's, a good idea. that's the appliances we're getting is on the date that See, we showed it. I always it. copy what they list out in the MLS. I copy that, paste that in, and then write in as viewed. Right. But, and, but you know, it's a good idea to say as viewed on, on this date. On that date. Because... If they change a light fixture or they yeah. change a TV or they change a... Because they don't know. necessarily know when you viewed it unless they go back and start checking. Right. right. You know, and I could make the argument, shame on the listing agent for saying, by the way, just so you know, those are not right. the appliances. But in theory, you know, the they have, might no, not have known. They not they have, have any duty. There. They have no duty to your buyer right. or you. Right. right. And they may not have known if... if the if it was a tenant occupied property and the agent went over there and listed it, he yeah. assumed or he she assumed that these appliances that are in there were the appliances Owners. owned by the owner. Right. Not that the tenant tenant normally doesn't bring a refrigerator with them. Right. Right. You know? Right. You could ask the seller, hey, stove refrigerator staying? And that seller's going, Yeah. Right. The right, ugly ones right. I got in my shed out back. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. But, all right, guys, thank you very much. Let's wrap it up here and we'll see you guys next week. All right, have a good day. See ya. Thank you.